Well, good morning and happy Sabbath to you. I'm glad that you tuned in. My name is Pastor Joe Savino from the Wenatchee Seventh-day Adventist Church in Wenatchee, Washington, and I'm glad that you have joined me for uh, a message today. Uh, at our church uh, this Sabbath, we are uh, celebrating a baccalaureate for our graduating seniors at Cascade Christian Academy, our single most uh, a significant outreach endeavor, our evangelistic endeavor to the young people of our community. And we're graduating 10 uh, seniors this, uh, this uh, weekend. Uh, so the school has uh, taken over the worship service and they will lead us in worship. And it's going to be a wonderful experience. Uh, my wife is going to be the, the, uh, the speaker for uh, the students uh, for, for this Sabbath, but I know that some of you are not able to make it to church, so I decided that I would uh, reach into my past, into some of my notes from long ago, and uh, I noticed some uh, very interesting thoughts that I think would uh, be helpful for us today. So I hope that you will uh, be blessed by this if you're unable to get out and you've chosen to tune in, obviously. Uh, this will be a good experience for you, and so thank you again for joining me. Uh, I have uh, titled this message, Caught in the Spin Cycle, and um, my passage for today is Matthew 11, 28 to 30, and you'll recognize these words when we read them, the words of Jesus. Um, this will only be online, and it won't be at church, obviously, uh, so this is specially done for just you, all right? <laughs> Why don't we get started with a word of prayer? Father in heaven, indeed you are a, a, a wonderful God, a loving Father who is very interested in uh, uh, our hearts and you want us to be at peace and you want us to be rested and you want us to, to rest in you. And so uh, the thoughts in this message today are, are those which will, will uh, gr grow us closer to you and more dependent upon you. And uh, we just pray that you will touch our hearts today as we uh, spend this time. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. A fascinating story appeared in the newspapers quite a while back, and uh, I remembered uh, this story. Police were called to a laundry, a laundromat in Nashville, Tennessee. And it seems a man had come in from the rain into this laundromat soaking wet, and he put a few coins in a, into a dryer, and he climbed in. <laughs> <laughs> and he was getting tumble dried in this laundromat, so they called the police to deal with it somehow. It's a crazy world, isn't it? Well, here was a man who was really, literally caught in the spin cycle. <laughs> it sounds a lot, lot like a, a gimmick that you'll uh, you'll find in the Saturday Evening Review magazine. In in each one of their issues, just for fun, someone there at the magazine hides a nonsense ad in, in the classified section. And uh, one month, this ad appeared. I wanted to share it with you. Look at this. Computer error has resulted in a large supply of electric-powered chairs that make approximately 150 high-speed revolutions per minute automatically as soon as body weight hits the seat. Excellent bargain for people who are nausea-resistant. <laughs> Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I think I must own one of those chairs, you know. Things happen so fast around me that I'm left reeling, uh, and I'm not sure I'm nausea-resistant. Can you relate to that at all? Well, if you can, then you're going to appreciate these words that come from the lips of Jesus. In today's scripture, in Matthew 11, 28 to 30, let's read them. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What encouraging words for our troubled spirits, don't you think? In the early days of the automobile, it was common for uh, eating and drinking establishments to be built along the road, along the highway, at the tops of long hills. 
some of us can remember the old days, uh, not but 40 or 50 years ago even. And they chose to uh, put their eating and drinking and uh, you know refueling stations at the top of these long uh, hills in these locations, obviously for the convenience of people who needed to stop and let their overheated radiators cool down. Some of you kids may not, un you know, appreciate this, but uh, back then the cars just weren't as as uh, resilient as cars are now. They they were not. Uh, they were much more vulnerable to the elements than they are today. And today you might not have any trouble getting. Uh, getting over, on, you know, some high steep hills in the summer, in the hot summer months, but uh, but back then it was it was very strategic for them to put these stations at the top of these hills. If you've driven I-5 into Southern California, you have driven uh, probably a 70-mile stretch of highway over the Tejon Pass, known as the Grapevine. Many of you who have driven down there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. For 70 miles, this, this uh, highway, I-5, just goes over, over the Tejon Pass. There's a lot of climbing from one side and then, of course, downhill to the other. And back in my childhood, we lived in Southern California, and that pass was a killer back then to drive over since it, it, it would get boiling hot and your car was almost guaranteed to overheat if you were not careful. And to combat the heat, many motorists would always carry with them uh, what was called a desert water bag. Uh, Coleman, you know, the company Coleman, they sold tons of these things, but other companies made them as well. In fact, you were crazy to travel the grapevine back then without one. And if you didn't have one, then what you'd have to do is travel the grapevine at night or do it early in the morning to avoid the heat. But one consolation that we all had was that at the top of that pass, at about mid, mid grapevine, you might say, was an exit at the little town of Gorman. If you've traveled that very much, you know the town of Gorman. At the time, we could hardly even call it a town. It was just a, a, a couple of gas stations and maybe a, a drive-in, you know, a fast food place. And that was about it. Uh, all, all anyone cared about, though, about making it to Gorman was that it had water and it had gas. That was the main reason you, you just, every anxious driver on the grapevine prayed that, they had, that they'd at least make it to Gorman, where they could rest and refresh and uh, resupply, right? Because we knew that it would all be downhill from there. It was at the summit of the grapevine, and you'd be okay if you could just make it there to rest and refresh. So it's always good to have a, a time and a, and a place to rest, isn't it? Actually, that's one of the functions of the Sabbath, isn't it? And of worship for many of us. That's what they're there for. It's a time for rest and, and refreshment when we let our spiritual, spiritually overheated radiators <laughs> cool down. Thus we welcome Jesus' words for today, I will give you rest. What beautiful words they are. First of all, uh, Jesus says we need some balance in our lives. This is his whole purpose in promising us rest. I will give you rest, he says. Christ didn't intend for us to be frantically on the go all the time, even if it's when we're serving him. He wanted us to rest, to, to take some time. I once uh, read that uh, early World War I fighter planes had no slow speeds at all. When, when Eddie Rickenbacker and the Red Baron were dueling it out over France, their aircraft engines had two power positions, full on and full off. <laughs> that was it. See, those early rotary engines didn't have uh, adjustable throttle at all. There was, that was invented a lot later. All they had was an on-off switch. You're either all the way on or all the way off. And so at contact, you know, the engine would bellow into an immediate full-throated roar 
And woe to the pilot who wasn't pointed in the right direction when some unlucky uh, private would hand prop their, their, their engine. And from that moment on, that engine was running at full RPMs. Now, of course, pilots of planes even today know the danger of running at full throttle. While it's necessary in order to get off the ground and to, to clear any obstructions, of course, full power is quickly going to burn out an engine. And, uh, and that's not only true for airplane engines. That's, our, that's, that's my analogy here. Human beings were never intended to operate at full throttle all the time either. Christ didn't mean for us to frantically be on the go uh, every minute of every day like so many of us are. In fact, Christ himself wasn't on the go all the time. He did a whole lot in those three years of his ministry, but he wasn't always on the go. Just think how often the scriptures say that he withdrew for a time apart. Luke 5, 16, for example, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. And notice how much time he spent with friends. Luke 9, for example, records the first potluck. <laughs> uh, look at this. It says, uh, verse 10 through 17, Then he took with them, took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, Send the crowd away so we can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging because we're in a remote place here. He replied, you give them something to eat. And they answered, we, we have only five loaves of bread and two fish. Unless we go and, uh, and buy some food for all this crowd. And then it says about 5,000 men were there. So that tells you that you could pretty much double that and triple it and maybe even quadruple it if you include the women and the children that had to have been in that group. That's a lot of people. But he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. The disciples did so and everybody sat down. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. That's why we pray before our meals. We, we give thanks. We return thanks to the Lord. And then he gave them to the disciples to set before the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. We can also see in the Gospels that Jesus took, took time to enjoy the beauties of nature, didn't he? Time to enjoy the laughter of little children. He loved being around the kids. Time to not only to minister to others, but also actually to allow them to minister to him in various ways. He, his was a life of balance. Dr. Ken Blanchard, who was uh, author of the One Minute Manager, told about a tour that he took of SeaWorld many years back. And on that tour, he, he, he learned how some employees of SeaWorld trained and worked with Shamu, the killer whale. Their killer whale there. Uh, we used to live down next to Shamu, and we'd go and see him a lot down in uh, San Diego. And Ken remembers on this tour, he remembers the staff saying that they divided Shamu's days into five different time periods for maximum effectiveness and health. And it was the work time, play time, free time, rest time, and learning time. <clears throat> and Dr. Blanchard said he wondered how many people are wise enough to systematically try to cover those same priorities every day. Work time, play time, free time, rest time, learning time, and, and we would add worship time, wouldn't we? Jesus is saying to us that we need balance in our lives. But how do we, how do we find that balance? We, we, well, we find it the same way Jesus found it. We find it by establishing priorities for our lives, just like he did. 
That's the second thing we need to see. We need to establish priorities. Kevin Miller wrote a, a helpful article years ago entitled, You Can Say No Without Feeling Guilty. Uh, and a number of people have written other books by that, a similar title to that. But this was just an article written by Kevin Miller. <clears throat> and in this article, he notes that Jesus had a specific, narrowly defined ministry. He didn't try to do everything as much as he did do. He didn't try to do everything. Notice, for example, how later in Matthew 15, 24, Jesus said he was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That would be the Jewish people. Yes, he's the savior of the whole world, isn't he? But, but his time and his energy while on earth were poured primarily into the Jewish people. Did it ever occur to you that while Jesus was on earth, the Roman Empire boasted 57,000 miles of roads? And you only see a little bit on this map that I put up for you. That's just a little bit of the roads. 57,000 miles of roads, more than in our entire interstate highway system today in this country. That's a lot of roads. That's a lot of road to travel, isn't it? And Jesus could have traveled the whole Mediterranean world, as Paul later did, actually. And he could have seen Greece and Italy and Turkey and Spain. He got, could have gotten to all of those areas. People in all of these places desperately needed him, didn't they? But Jesus stayed within one tiny chunk of the world, mostly within the regions of Judea and Galilee. On the, on the, what would that be? The eastern shores of the Mediterranean. And that was it, just a little tiny chunk. And that's primarily where Jesus stayed. Even though Jesus had a whole world to save and to reach with this wonderful good news, the gospel, he established priorities for his life and for his work. And so should we. And we should know that, uh, that that's the great secret of time management, isn't it? Establishing priorities. What are those things that are really important in your life? Just think of that for a second. What's really important in your life? And once you figure that out, and once you have a little small list of things that are most important in your life, those are the things to which you and I should be devoting the major portion of our time. That's the emphasis that uh, Alan Lekine makes in his book, How to Get Control of Your Time and Your Life. And according to Lekine, one of the most basic questions that we can ask is, what would I be doing if I only had six months to live? <laughs> ask yourself that question. And then compare your answer with your current life. What are you doing today compared to what you would do if you knew you only had six months to live. Lakine did ask some members of a group we was working with to fill out some question, questionnaires on that very subject. And their answers were very revealing. Within six months, or with six months uh, remaining in their lives, their most common preference was to spend time with family, look up old friends, travel, read, and write. But very few of them were currently doing those things. And when they were asked how their actual lives compared to their six months to live scenario, their, their comments included far from it, totally opposite. One said zilch, another one said ha. <laughs> Some of them just said, I spend too much of my life trying to succeed. Another person said, I'm too busy living for tomorrow. And so Jesus is, is, is saying to us, evaluate your life. Uh, does your schedule reflect your real priorities? Have you included time for rest, for friends, for worship, for spiritual growth? These are the things that are eternal. These are the things that are most important, right? Have you, have you arranged your schedule in accordance with what is most important in life? You may have seen a book by uh, Mark McCormick that's called What They Don't Teach You at Harvard Business School. This was written many years ago. And at the time, this man's management techniques were widely accepted 
and they were highly acclaimed. He personally spent a full hour each day deciding on how to invest the other 23 hours. That was his, his, his habit. Now think about that for a minute. One hour spent each day deciding how to use the rest of the day. What's that sound like to you? Right there, we find the models of prayer and meditation in our lives. Isn't that what we're called to do? Meditate on the Lord daily, moment by moment? We need to set time aside every day and evaluate our lives in the light of our priorities, right? Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, says Jesus. Establish balance for your life by establishing priorities for your life. But there's a third uh, principle. It simply goes like this. Yoke yourself to Christ. You know what that means, right? And that's the secret to establishing the right priorities and finding the balance we need in our lives. Yoke yourself to Him. You can see the picture in your mind, can't you? Uh, even though it comes from probably a different time, a different day and different time, you know. You've seen the pictures of cattle that are yoked together or perhaps water buffalo. I met a water buffalo uh, back in the Philippines in the late 80s when I was on a mission trip there. And uh, I don't recommend trying to ride a, a water buffalo like I did. <laughs> That's another story. But they are often yoked together to achieve some kind of a, a task or, or, or carry some sort of a burden or pull some sort of a load, right? Very much like you and I need, we, we all have burdens and we, have all, uh, we all have loads uh, to pull. I've heard some say that they think being yoked to Christ would be pretty dull. Uh, kids have so told me that, you know. I think it'd be kind of dull, they say. I wonder about that. Every account we have about Jesus shows that he was a man who loved life, he loved people, a man who knew how to live life to its fullest. Why did everyone, everyone want to be around him except his enemies, right? Why, did, why, why was that the case? Why did they all want to be around him? My guess is he was, the, he was a blast to hang around with. I doubt that a life yoked to Christ could possibly be dull. Even more important, I suspect that many of our fears, many of our anxieties, many of our frustrations, they would melt quickly away if our lives were connected to His life. I may be preaching here today to someone whose life is in constant turmoil, continual turmoil. Somehow you can't get it all together. You're behind in your work. You're neglecting your family. You're neglecting your church. You're neglecting to go to church. You're neglecting your responsibilities to yourself. And it could be because you struggle with personal discipline, if you're being honest about it. Hey, wouldn't your life just be simpler if you were yoked to Christ? Because really, this isn't just a, an idea. It's not just a concept. It's not even just a strategy. It's a reality that when we yoke ourselves to Christ, He helps to bear our burden. He could bear a whole burden, but He wants us to participate, right? What our text is calling for is a life that is so focused on the person of Jesus Christ that His priorities now become our priorities. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I'll make your load lighter. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light, and it's anything but dull. I'm just throwing that in there because that's what I believe. Of course, the principal reason his yoke is easy and his burden is light is that he bears most of the load for us. We are no longer pulling that cart by ourselves. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He guides our lives in the way that they should go. Doug Forsberg, who, is, uh, who, who, who pastors and is a professor of urban 
ministry in practical theology at Southern Na Nazarene University down in Bethany, uh, Oklahoma. He told, uh, long ago, he told about a, a phone call that he received at 3 a.m. on a bone-chilling January night. And the man's voice on the other end was panic-stricken. The caller was a man who would sometimes attend Forsberg's church. When, whenever he did happen to go to church, he would go to where uh, Pastor Forsberg was. And that man, he, he had no one else to call, but he, he called them and uh, he called Pastor Forsberg and he announced to him that he'd been thrown into jail earlier that day. Now, he was panicked, not just because of that, but because his two children, ages two and four, had been involved in a car accident and he didn't know their condition. All he could do, all he knew was that his roommate had been drinking and took the kids in the car and hit a telephone pole. So he was very, very worried. Well, Forsberg told the man on the phone that he'd come to the jail and together they'd, they'd find out what had happened. So Forsberg got himself dressed. He headed for the jail in the dark of night. And when he arrived there, the man who had called him was sitting in his cell with his two kids on his lap. They had been brought to him. The kids had had a few scrapes and cuts, you know, but their father was overjoyed that for the most part they were unharmed. The ambulance driver had taken the kids to the jail and now the police were in a quandary about what to do with them. So Forsberg and his wife took temporary custody of those two little ones for, uh, on, uh, for, for that whole cold night. He told their father that they'd look after him until other arrangements could be made. One of the police officers helped him wrap the kids in uh, some blankets because they didn't have any coats and then carry them shivering to the pastor's car. And as they walked to the parking lot, Forsberg couldn't help but think how frightened these two little ones must be. Her father was in jail. They'd been in a car accident under the care of a drunk, and now they were going home with a stranger. And he will always remember from that night uh, a question that the four-year-old girl, the big sister, asked him as he buckled her seatbelt in, you know, in the back seat of his car. As he was fastening that buckle, she stopped him and she held his arm. And she looked up at him with frightened brown eyes and he said she asked him, can you dwive? <laughs> On that January night, a child was struggling with the issue of trust. Sin uh, is in all of us, and she wasn't sure who she could trust. She had just been in a car accident. Would this stranger do any better? But that's a question that you and I struggle with every day. It's essentially the question that's at the center of the, the meaning of life, isn't it? Can I trust God with my life? Can I focus my life on Christ and trust that He will help me with my burden and lead me to where I need to go? Maybe God's response to us during our own times of struggle would be similar to what Pastor Forsberg told a frightened four-year-old little girl on a dark, cold Texas night. Yes, little one, I can drive. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, says Jesus. Have you been living in the spin cycle? I've been there. Wouldn't it help? If we just chose to find balance in our lives, that's what being yoked to Christ is all about. Centering our life on Him. Letting His priorities be our priorities. Letting Him shoulder our burdens with us. Trusting that He knows how to drive and that He will lead us where He, need, where he knows we need to go. Thereby, finding rest for our souls. For His yoke is easy, and His burden is light. 
Would you pray with me as we close? Father, thank you so much for reminding us today that we don't have to be alone in the struggles and in the challenges of life. And as we bear our burden, help us to remember that giving it to you and yoking ourselves with you will make our load lighter, will provide rest for us, refreshment, and uh, refuel, refueling. <laughs> and uh, we just uh, thank you for always being interested enough uh, to give us all that you can and all that you know we need if we'll only turn to you. So today, help us to not forget these things, not forget your availability and willingness to, to come through for us. That's what you want in your relationship with us. Thank you for this time, and we pray these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining me today. Have a great rest of the Sabbath, and I'll see you next time. God bless you.